All right. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to another Charter Cities Institute Research Q&A video. My name is Carl Peterson, and I am an attorney and legal researcher here at the Charter Cities Institute. And joining me today is Professor Tom W. Bell, a professor of law at Chapman University and the creator of ULEX, an open source legal system, which is the topic of our discussion today. So Professor Bell, please take it away. Thank you, Carl. Pleased to be here. I'm happy to tell you all about ULEX. I'm going to start by sharing my screen where you can see um, a couple of lovely logos, one for ULEX, the open source legal system, and the other for CCI. Um, so let me tell you about ULEX. I'm going to start by telling you about the best source for information about ULEX, and that's my book, Your Next Government. This is the uh, Amazon page, and I'll just show you if you open up the book, you can actually on Amazon um, get access to a fair amount, not all of it, but right here is the chapter that we're going to be looking at, 3.7, ULEX, an open source legal system. I'm not going to read this uh, out loud. <laughs> there is a new audiobook version. If you do want the red version, um, there is now a version of that. But uh, I just want to make sure you know where to go if you want to learn all the details. So I'm basically going to tell you some stuff that is um, in the book and that um, you can learn through me also, plus some updates. This is the audiobook. And please know the audiobook is an updated version, which does have some new news about ULEX, which I'll share with you too. All right, so let's talk about um, where ULEX came from. And it's actually inspired by history of computer science. These are a couple of brilliant men who have been overlooked by most historians, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. Back in 1969 at Bell Laboratories, they invented Unix, Unix, and you can hear the, the similarity between ULEX and Unix, that's deliberate. Now you've never heard of these guys, but they're awesome. Why are they awesome? It tells you more here if you want to read about them, but the thing that I care about that's important for ULEX that I want to tell you about is what, what Thompson and Ritchie did was they liberated software from the constraints of any one particular um, computer. Let me, let me explain that for a second. So before Thompson and Ritchie created Unix, every time you created a new computer, you had to write the code from scratch because every machine was new and different. It was before really computer science was a science. And um, by the time Thompson and Ritchie got there in 1969, there was enough standardization. They thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had a single computer operating system we could put on different computers? Even if they had different chips, or back then they probably used vacuum tubes, um, wouldn't that be great? And then, yes, it would be great. And that's what they did. They created Unix. And again, the charm of Unix doesn't hit you in the face, but it's a really powerful idea. The charm of Unix is you can take one operating system and put it on different platforms. So that's great. If you're working at Bell Labs in New Jersey, you can go work at Bell Labs in New Mexico and use their computer. Same operating system, different computer, and it's the interface is the same. It's a way to do things if you're doing computer science. Why is that so exciting to a person who works in the law and who basically designs legal systems for private jurisdictions? Because code is code. That's the way I view it. I view myself as kind of a lawyer programmer. And what we don't have much of yet in the law is what, what Unix does. Instead, basically now at the nation state level, there are exceptions I'm going to get to in a second. But basically, the template is every country has its own code, and they write it from scratch. And if you get into it, it's usually got all kinds of quirky historical artifacts, a lot of bugs in the programs, stuff blows up all the time. It's not at all a science. The computer scientists have gotten this down to a science. People writing laws for government, not there yet. Let's go back. I want to share some more stuff with you to show you that I don't want to over, I don't want to overplay my hand here um, in that um, there's a movement towards kind of doing what Thompson and Ritchie did. I'm going to show you some examples. So this is the law from the Dubai International Financial Center. So right now I'm going to show you three or four jurisdictions that have started moving towards having something like Unix. And this is the setup for ULEX, because ULEX does for special jurisdictions 
what Unix does for computers. The idea with ULEX is to create an operating system you can port from one platform to another more or less seamlessly. There are lots of good things that come from that. I haven't really talked much about that, but trust me, it's something you really want to do. Just like Thompson and Ritchie are heroes of computer science because they made computer science so much better, made computers so much useful. I want to try to do something like that with ULEX, but I don't want to overplay my hand here. I won't pretend this is a completely original idea. I mean, heck, Thompson and Ritchie got there first. But let's, um, let's take a look at how they do it in the Dubai International Financial Center. This is a, um, a special jurisdiction in the United Emirates, one of several Emirates. Uh, Dubai is one of several in the UAE, and they created their own laws in this jurisdiction. They did it primarily so that people from uh, other countries could come in and do business without too much trouble. Initially under Sharia law, which is the governing law in the UAE, for example, basically interest on loans was forbidden. And they wanted to invite London bankers and other financial powerhouses to come down and do business in Dubai. So they had to change the law. So what'd they do? Here is the law in the DIFC. And I want you to notice here at the very bottom, right here, this section, they import the laws of England and Wales, the laws of England and Wales. Now, a lot of people talk loosely about the DIFC and they say, oh, they imported the common law. And I've said that myself but I'm always, I try to be careful to add the caveat. It's at the bottom of the list, okay? Really, the law here is if they have a regulatory rule, that's the law. And then if they don't have that, if the parties choose a law, that's the law. And it goes way down to the very end. This is their kind of firewall, their backstop, so that there will always be some law out there if you don't nail it down earlier. It's not really importing the common law. It's a step in that direction. All right, so let's note before we leave the DIFC, that's an amazing thing. This is a, a, a country under Sharia law that has basically imported the common law from England and Wales. Now there are limits to this. They didn't like, you know, they didn't say the queen of England is now our queen, but it's a step in that direction. And they did it for good reason. And it's been a huge success. The DIFC has been a huge, huge success and it's been copied. Let's take a look at the ADGM. This is another emirate in the UAE. And this is their law. They, they basically followed the Dubai model. And look what they did. They structured it differently, but if you're a lawyer, as, as Carl is, I'm sure he's probably looking at this now and figuring it out. They start out with the law of England. They say the law of England shall apply and have legal force in the ADGM. And then they start kind of hedging on it. So they say, they did a kind of reverse here. Here in, in the DIFC, they gave the rules first and they put the common law at the end. Here they did the reverse, but logically it comes out the same. Notwithstanding um, these changes, there's these other rules that are gonna apply. So I'm not gonna get into all the lawyerly geek out here. I just wanna give you another example of a country, a jurisdiction within a country that has imported the common law. So I hope you see how this is a bit like, um, a bit like what they did with Unix. There are these platforms where the countries have said, we're gonna import the code, not the whole operating system, but we're gonna borrow some legal code from this other country and we're gonna install it on our platform and we're gonna run it because then people from England can come here and do business or people really from, from almost any common law jurisdiction, they'll be you know, not totally up to speed, but they'll be more comfortable now than they would have been under Sharia law. You can have an attorney from Australia go to the DIFC and she'll have to read the regulations, but it'll be easier for her. So this opens up the world to them. They get lawyers from all over, business from all over. They get integrated with the common law economic sphere, which is very powerful because the common law is kind of, kind of great. <laughs> the reason people keep borrowing the common law is because it's a really good set of rules. All right, let's go back and look at some more examples. I think you're, you're getting the picture here that, whoa, you know, maybe ULEX is interesting, but it's really a step in a direction that a lot of people, a lot of jurisdictions have been going. So I don't want to, I don't want to overplay it. I don't think it's, really that biggest step. Let's look at another example. Not many people know about the Astana International Financial Center, but it's out there. And again, it's a special jurisdiction. It's in Kazakhstan. And they definitely followed the UAE. They looked at the UAE and they said, oh, Dubai, big success. Oh, ADGM over in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Looks like they're doing it there. And, and it seems like it's working too. Let's do this in Kazakhstan. 
So look here what they did. They got the, this is very much like Dubai. They said the law to be applied by the court is our local rules, right? So they have a constitutional statute and then there's regulations they create locally in Kazakhstan. Finally, down at the very end, you know, they may be guided by, uh, guided by decisions of the court and decisions made in other common law jurisdictions. That's pretty loosey goosey, but again, it's like Dubai. They're saying, end of the day, we have a conflict. We don't have a rule that we've written that covers it. Rest assured, the common law is out there and it'll patch the gaps. Right, so that's pretty good, interesting. These are conventional countries, however. These are conventional countries with kind of neat special jurisdictions which have some autonomy, but now I'm gonna blow your mind. If you haven't heard of Prospera, welcome to Prospera. Um, I might've mispronounced it there, it's Prospera. The accent is at the first syllable, Prospera. My Spanish speaking friends have explained to me that's because the, um, the people who came up with this word are using a verb tense in Spanish that looks to the future. This is very future oriented. So this is a special jurisdiction in Honduras. The background map here is this is the northern coast of Honduras. Honduras is a Latin American country in Central America that place in the Isthmus of Panama where it does a dog leg turn. And so there is a northern coast. And this is the island of Roatan. And that's where the Prospera Zede is. A Zede is a special jurisdiction created under the laws of Honduras. So you're thinking, okay, it's another special jurisdiction. It's like the DIFC or ADGM. And I'd say, yeah, it's kind of like that, except um, you know, with, with uh, steroids, it's much more autonomous. Basically in Prospera, it wasn't simply, oh, why don't you set up a commercial platform so bankers can come and be comfortable? Rather, the Honduran ZA statute allows the ZA, indeed requires the ZA to basically write all of its own law, except for the criminal code. The criminal code, they have to accept the Honduran criminal code, at least at the start. They can later if they want to, the ZA can propose new criminal laws. They have to be approved by the National Assembly of Honduras. So there's even room there to innovate. But the short of it is for our purposes here today is all of the non-criminal law has to come from the people who created Prospera. And I worked on the team. Uh, I've uh, done work in Honduras for years. This is actually the third team I've worked on trying to get a ZA going. And they're the ones that made it. This has launched. It is open and running. It's been a big success so far. It's only been kind of accepting uh, people who want to buy property or do business there for the last six months. And it haven't been the best six months for doing business internationally, but they're doing okay. They actually oversubscribe. So the thing I want to show you here, so this is, this is Prospera and I worked on the legal code and let's go over here and look at the Roatan common law code. And um, this basically ha has a lot of stuff, but at the kernel of it, I'm going to scroll down here. You will see, let me go to the next page. Look at these rules here. These are going to look familiar to you starting at substantive law. So look at the tort law here. Where did Prospera, which by the way, is commanded in the statute. There's a statute the Honduran uh, government passed allowing the creation of these ZAs. And that statute says, basically, we want you to use the common law. Now that's a civil law country. So they don't have a ton of experience with common law, but they know where the action is. They can see that international business likes the common law. They wanna be able to draw in a lot of business from America in particular. They're in the same time zone as uh, the United States. So they want to make it comfortable for Americans and other common law business people to do business. But where are they going to get those rules? Now, we saw how these other jurisdictions did it. They kind of punted to another country. And I'll tell you right now, as a guy who's worked in this field, I don't think that's best practices. I think, in fact, that's a very dangerous practice. For one country to tie its law, even if it's just in a special jurisdiction, even if it's just about commercial matters, for one country to tie its law to another sovereign's law is a bad thing to do for a couple of reasons. One, there could be patriots locally who take offense, and I get it, especially in a place like Honduras, which has seen the bad side of colonialism more than once. I could easily imagine that if Honduras had done, I'm going to go back to uh, looking at people, if Honduras, had, if Honduras had done what what Paul Romer advocated, Paul Romer who I guess kind of came up with the word charter cities. He actually borrowed it from another different context. 
which is actually kind of confusing because charter cities are actually legal entities of a very different sort. I don't think Romer maybe talked to an attorney before he chose that, whatever. Romer introduced this idea of charter cities and initially he's backed off of this, but initially Romer's idea was, oh, we'll go find some poor beleaguered country like Madagascar where Romer made some headway before he ran into problems or Honduras where Romer made some headway before he ran into problems. We'll go find some country that really needs some better rules and we'll get another country to provide those rules. He thought maybe Canada would be a good candidate. I got nothing against the laws of Canada, but um, I'll tell you, Hondurans don't want Canadian flags over their soil because they're patriots. And you don't have to be much of a patriot. You don't even have to love your country to kind of bridle at the picture that Canadians are so much better than us. Oh, again, here come the Northerners with their flags and their laws. In theory, great idea. Politically, no, bad idea. So that's one reason why it's just not a great way to approach this problem. You really want a flag-free set of rules. And Dubai didn't do that. Kazakhstan didn't do that. Honduras didn't say to do that, but that's what we did because we saw the problem coming down the pike. And the other reason it's not good to tie, I think the DIFC is especially bad on this. If you get into the details, I think the ADGM handles it better, but the DIFC basically says, yeah, the common law of England and Wales over there, it's at the bottom of the list, but that is our law in this jurisdiction. So what's the problem? What if they change the law? The people in England and Wales do not give a toot about the DIFC. In fact, I could imagine someone strategically going to England or Wales and changing the law with the idea they're gonna poke a stick in the eye of the DIFC. The local courts, they could pass some new judgment reinterpreting the law of England and Wales. I've heard international attorneys who've set up this kind of system praise it as evergreen. It's an evergreen legal system because as soon as they update the law in England and Wales, your law is updated accordingly. A terrible idea. What if they take the law in a different direction? Plus, the law of England and Wales, okay, okay, it seems to work well there, but it's encrusted, take it from a law professor who has taught first year property classes, it is encrusted with a number of archaic distinctions, which you know came from the history of England and Wales, have nothing to do with Dubai. I wouldn't trust those archaic rules developed under a completely different social legal system to work well in Dubai. Bad system. So don't use foreign laws because it offends local patriots for good reason. It does kind of look like colonialism. And don't tie your local law to foreign laws in this evergreen way because they can go change your law and you leave, it leaves you in a bad place. So that's why with Prospera, what we did was something different. Let's go back to that, the Rotan Common Law Code. And so you can see here, let's just take tort law. How do you get tort law? You got no precedents to draw on. You're not gonna bring the Canadian flag down to Honduras. So here's what I did. I looked to the restatement of torts. The restatement of torts is published by the ALI, the American Law Institute, which is a fine institution. It is staffed uh, with the, well, not really staffed, they're members, it's just peopled with esteemed lawyers and judges and legal academics. And together they get together and they think hard about the common law and they create these restatements. People who've read a ton of cases, they sit down and they basically boil it all down to a few simple rules and they publish it as the restatement of the common law of torts. So there in a codified, nice, neat way, um, you can see all the rules. And so I'm gonna scroll down a little more. I'm gonna show you how it goes. We got, there's our, there's our, um, Oops, I want to go up a little. There's our contract law, the restatement second of torts. And I actually have a copy of that right here on my desk because I teach contract law right now. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to just going to put this under your nose. So you'll see what the restatement of torts looks like. This is a very much marked up copy, but I want you to note how much it looks like, how much it looks like a statute. Right, it's all neatly organized. There's a table of contents. Everything is broken out in these very clear, simple, elegant, parsimonious rules. So you can read this easily. And this is a boon to our friends who did not grow up under the common law. I think US attorneys and attorneys in common law countries, they don't appreciate enough how hard it is for them to know the law. If you're talking about the common law, strictly speaking, the common law comes out of cases. So if you're advising a client on the common law of contracts, strictly speaking, you should have gone out and read a ton of cases on contract law and then come up with this idea about how it's supposed to work. Really, very few people do that. 
It's almost an, uh, an impossible gargantuan task. So what real attorneys do is they look at a few cases that are close to the case they have. And they look at the restatement and they find it all broken out nice and neat. And that's a beautiful thing for them. But it's especially beautiful for people in civil law countries. They know very little about this case law, which is scattered all over the place. They probably don't know how to research. It's why people go to law school. They're familiar with a civil law setup. And in a civil law system, your laws look a lot like that restatement. It's all indexed. It's a set of rules. Yeah, there are decisions under those rules, and those are interesting, but that's not the law. The law is, boom, in black and white. That's what the restatements gives you. That's why it makes so much sense to use it in a place like Honduras. And indeed, I came up with ULEX for the ZA system. Basically, those are my clients. And my client said, we need rules, Bell. We need a bunch of common law rules. How are we going to do that? And I very quickly said, we're not going to do that by using the Canadian flag or the flag of any country. That's not going to fly. Well, then where do we get the rules? And I, because I'm a law professor, I know where to get them, man. We're going to use them for the restatements. Let's go back and look at some other things here. Actually, what, what I think I'll do now is take you to ULEX. So I, I've taken you up to the point where you can actually see this being implemented. So this is ULEX in the real world. This is basically ULEX. And I'm going to take you to ULEX now and show you ULEX. Now, you can get it. Um, other ways, but this is probably the best source for your information about ULEX. I want you to know we are here on GitHub. GitHub is the basically the place where people have open source code. So if you're a coder who writes conventional computer code, you could go to GitHub and have other people help you with your open source code. For example, to run some app so you can do um, sharing of photos on a, on, a, on a social platform. You could have the code here and other coders would help you. So to me, because I view code as code, it seemed to make perfect sense to use GitHub for ULEX. So you can go here, there's a pretty picture here of, this is actually, there's a plant called ULEX, um, and it's also called Gorse or Win, and there's a nice, pretty public domain picture of it. And then here is ULEX, and I'll scroll down and just show you how, there it is. There's our tort law, you remember we saw that? Um, it will scroll down, you can see here contract law, there's the restatement second of contracts. So now let's just take a moment. So now you see, I hope, how um, there's a need for ULEX, how it does things similarly to, but differently from these examples in the real world. And the ultimate model is a Unix type, open source, transportable operating system. The idea is with ULEX, you can set up a special jurisdiction in Honduras. You can set it up on a, a floating vessel, a seastead. I guess you could do it on a space station. You could do it anywhere, anywhere where you have the authority, indeed the obligation to come up with rules, ULEX puts it on a plate, makes it well organized, easy to use. Um, and let's take a look at it now. I wanna just kind of give you a fly through of ULEX. It starts out, there's three big parts, the procedural rules, the substantive rules, and the meta rules. I'm just gonna go through these quickly. So the procedural rules are those that help you decide disputes. And this is the core of ULEX's procedure. You have judges which are chosen by the parties. And here as elsewhere in ULEX, I tried to do only copying. I tried not to write anything myself. And indeed, none of these three things here that set up the default procedural rules are unique to me. I found all these in actual practice. In actual practice, in the real world, it is frequently the case that arbitrations are resolved by panels of judges chosen by the parties. And how does it work? Each party chooses a judge, so each party chooses a judge, and then those two judges choose the third who chairs the panel of judges. So now you've got three judges, so they can't have a tie vote, and nobody can say of that panel of judges, there's something like unfair about it, like, you know, one party chose the panel and it's unfair to the other party. Now let's just observe, one, this is the way big, powerful, smart commercial entities do things in international law. That's where I got the idea. And let's note also, secondly, this is totally not what most countries do for their citizens. If you have a dispute against your government, how does that work? I got I the government passes a law and says, oh, we don't like the things you're saying about, about the pandemic, Tom. You're too much of a skeptic. It's a public health hazard. We're going to censor you. And of course, it's a First Amendment problem. So what do I do? I go to, oh, oh, I got to go to a government court. I'm suing the government 
I got to go to the government court to sue the government. That is facially wrong. In fact, it's so wrong. <laughs> that same government court that says, oh, Tom, you know, we get the sole authority to decide whether or not you're, you know, violating the First Amendment, whether or not there's an unconstitutional action by the government. That same court would never let a private party get away with the same thing. Suppose I rented a car at Avis Rent-A-Car and there's a user agreement and there's an arbitration clause and it says in the event of any disputes, you don't get to go to a public court. You have to do it in private arbitration. OK, that's pretty standard. And the arbitration will be decided by the CFO, COO and CEO of Avis Rent-A-Car. There's no way that that same government court that is so ready to hear my First Amendment claim, there's no way that it would let Avis do that to me. Well, that's just wrong. And I'm here to fix that. That's a thing that needs to be changed. And that's one reason I put this into ULEX. Let's go back and look at some more things in ULEX. So I just want to you know, note, that seems like a pretty fair way to do things. I didn't come up with it myself. That's the way smart, powerful people who don't get pushed around by their governments do things. This is another thing I got from actual practice. So a problem we have with arbitration very frequently in the real world is arbitrators split the baby. One party says, you owe me a million. And the other party says, no, 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 we owe you zero. We owe you zero. And what they, and then the arbitrators will typically kind of center on $500,000. It's kind of in between, it's kind of reasonable. But the problem with that approach is it makes the parties rush to extremes. If you know they're gonna split the baby, it pushes you away from compromise. You say, oh, we better ask for 2 million. So we can get the 1 million we really think we should get. And of course the other person says, heck, I'm gonna say not only do I owe them nothing, they owe me money. And so the parties don't settle. That's dumb. And there's a better way to do it. And the better way to do it is called uh, last best offer or baseball arbitration. Again, I got this from other parties, other institutions. And basically all the arbitrators do is they choose a remedy offered by one of the parties. So if you get greedy, and you think, oh, I'm going to go for $2 million. I really think I only owe me $1 million, but I'm going to go for $2 million. <laughs> You're not going to risk that in ULEX because the panel of arbitrators might say, that's too much. The other party was willing to pay $100,000. And while we think that's well short of the, of the million they really owe you, you're asking for a million more. So no, we're going to give it to the other party. And of course, loser pays. Almost everywhere else in the world, except in the United States, loser pays pays. It's a good system. That's why other countries do it, because it discourages frivolous litigation. There's some other stuff here about the appeals. The appeals are interesting. This is a new addition to version 1.2 of ULEX. I'm not going to get into it now because it is a little complicated, but I will say what this rule does is it creates a decentralized system of appellate decision making. You can appeal from one of these decisions without having to have an institution that judges initial cases or that handles appeals. Basically what I'm looking for in ULEX is no standing judiciary. I have come to the conclusion that a standing judiciary, a panel of officials who have been appointed by a government to decide disputes is a mistake. It has failed us in the United States. We do look to courts to save what remains of our rights in the United States, but they have been grotesquely eroded by government courts deciding government cases. It's just not the way to govern. That's not going to happen under ULEX. All right, so there's the procedure. Let's look at substantive rules. Not going to get into much detail here. I'm going to roll through it quickly so you'll see, wow, Tom went to the library and found a lot of stuff, and indeed I did. So there's tort law. All this stuff is out there. It's in black and white, beautifully organized. There's property law, same thing there. Contract law, those are the big three of common law. It protects persons, property, and promises, the big three Ps of the common law. You could almost stop with those three and have a pretty civilized society. I think more detail is helpful though, and they wanted it in Honduras, so I provided it. So here's a bunch more additional restatements of the common law and also some uniform commercial codes. Now these are different from common law rules. The common law restatements from the ALI are basically summations of what courts have done. The uniform commercial codes are a slightly different animal. The ALI was involved, as you can see, along with the ULC in their creation, but these are basically codifications by private entities. Both the ALI and the ULC are not government entities. They are private entities in the United States, although the ALI does have members from other countries. It's a common law directed organization. 
But basically they got together and they created all these many useful commercial codes, which many of which have been adopted by US states. The idea was let's give a bunch of rules to US states so that North Dakota doesn't have to write its own rule for secured transactions. That's kind of complicated stuff. North Dakota could get it wrong. They might want some help. Let's do it for them. And let's just pause here and note a beautiful thing about what's happening with these rules. There's no lobbying. There's no lobbying involved with these rules. There's no reason for anybody to go ALI, ALI and say, oh, ALI, we think you should tweak contract law this way because you know we're insurance companies. Now, I won't pretend that never happens, but there's nothing. I mean, I'm sure once in a while some insurance person you know, talks to a professor and says, you know, I wish you'd think more about insurance companies. We have special problems. But they're not lobbying. They're not taking these people writing the code on golf outings to Bahamas. And also with the Uniform Commercial Code. If you get a statute from North Dakota, I mean, we hope it'll be good, but you can bet there's going to be a lot of lobbyists that shape it. And I don't trust it. I don't think we should. The people who created these uniform commercial codes, I won't pretend they were angels. I won't pretend they didn't have, you know, maybe some, some other interests in mind, but I think we're getting much better product out of those private bodies, not subject to lobbying. So I trust it more. That's the kind of stuff I want to have my clients use. So let's go back and look at some more. Then we move into some more, these are uniform acts, which are kind of like uniform commercial codes, kind of statutes created for states that want to handle these things through professional uniform means. And so we got stuff for natural persons. So families are covered. Here's corporations, partnerships. Um, then there's some substantive administrative rules. So the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act and the Recording Act. It's kind of boring stuff, but really important. Here in the very end of the substantive section, I did have to write some code myself. I was kind of uncomfortable about this. I don't think anyone should trust me. I don't mean that because I'm untrustworthy. I'll say people can trust me, but you shouldn't have to trust me. So I try to as much as possible make it so that I'm using stuff other people have pre-approved. Here I couldn't, but I think anyone who's worked in the areas of law that are involved here, we'll look at this just to take one and say, that's pretty reasonable. It's definitely on the conservative side. A lot of states have age of consent at 16. It's an, every time I had to make a choice here, I went very conservative. I had to write this. This is new to 1.2. I'm very happy with it, but it's a, more complicated than I ideally would like to write, but there's nothing, I couldn't find anything standardized, uniform, nothing from the ULC, ALI. And we really need, it turns out the common law doesn't treat people who survive, uh, who die in accidents very well. So you need this kind of patch. All right, so those are the substantive rules. And now let's quick, look quickly at the meta rules. And the meta rules are basically just kind of like programmer type rules to uh, avoid blow ups. So here's just take one. This is very obvious how this last one works. If you have two rules that give conflicting results, the one list, listed later in the index prevails. So if you go down, it's kind of a more powerful rule. And so you'll notice this is the last rule because you don't want any rule to trump the no conflicts rule. So I won't dwell on that. I think those of you who've done coding will see you kind of nod your heads and say, yes, that makes perfect sense. There's an optional criminal law module if you want to adopt that, um, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay, there's ULEX. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing there. And I'm, I've almost, I think I've shown you most of what I wanted to show you. You've seen the inspiration in Unix. You've seen how most of the places in the world, we're still you know, where computer science was before Thompson and Ritchie. Every time we have a separate platform, a bunch of, frankly, a bunch of non-professional people who are lobbied pretty hard to do the wrong thing, they're in charge of making the rules. It's a terrible, terrible system. Or at least we can do better. It's maybe it's better than having warlords who you know summarily execute people. It's progress, but we still got a ways to go. We're above the abacus. We're to computers most of the world, but we're not doing Unix. Few jurisdictions are heading that way. They've had some initial efforts. You've heard that I'm quite critical of what has been done. You know, approving in the sense that way to go, Dubai. Nice try, Kazakhstan. You don't have it dialed in yet. Honduras is probably the best example. I'm working other, with other clients now. So there's a prospect now, there's a place I can now point to on the map and say, just as with, I have my, my Android cell phone here and Android, the Android operating system is the most popular operating system in the world. I mean, cause it is an operating system on a smartphone, just like an operating system on a computer. And because these Android phones are so popular, that's the most popular operating system in the world. And at its heart, 
is a kernel, a Linux kernel. Linux is another open source operating system is created by Linus Torvalds. And some purists say you should call it GNU slash Linux. I don't want to get into that debate. But the point is this too, this is the most popular operating system in the world and it's got a kernel of something much like Unix, Linux at its heart. And that's like Prospera has a kernel at its heart, which is Ulix flavored. They've done some tweaking. You know how it is with code. You, you give the world the code on a plate and they integrate it into their system by making changes. I helped them make some of that system, those changes. And then I, I no longer work actively on that project. I helped with the development and now I'm working with other clients. And I can, when I go back and visit, I can see, oh, they've changed a few things. It's great. That's what clients should do to kind of tailor it to their system and their environment. Um, so I can point to a place on the map and say, there's, there's Unix, uh, uh, Ulex inside, just like you sometimes see, you know, Intel inside. I go, there's Unix, uh, Ulex, Ulex inside of that operating system. And I'm working with clients now that are probably going to do a pure, we're not done yet, but probably do a kind of a cleaner use of Ulex. It'll be much more sort of just like, take that code and whoop, there it is. So you think, oh, that's great. You're done. No, I want to be clear. Ulex is only part of a complete governing system. Now with this, uh, my newest client is Free Society Project, and we're actually building out the whole governing system. And I just wanna clarify, you might be thinking, well, come on, man, there were all those rules. Surely you covered everything. And no, we didn't. I'll just take an example off the top of my head, immigration policy. Nothing, nothing, nothing in uh, ULEX addresses that. It's not a civil law issue, right? Uh, the common law doesn't have immigration controls. There's no uniform commercial code of immigration. And yet, if you're running a sovereign jurisdiction that has its own territory, that's the goal with Free Society Project. The goal specifically is to go find a sovereign that has more territory than it really needs and less money than it really needs and go to that sovereign territory and say, you know, you got this island over there and you know, it's part of your sovereign territory. You're really not using it. Not many people are there. We can, we can put it to good use. Let's talk. And you end up doing a treaty with them and you create a new sovereign. There's ways to do this. It won't be the first time it's ever been done, although it'll be more radical than the way it's ever been done in the past. And so we'll have this territory and we'll have to run everything from soup to nuts. So we will need some kind of immigration policy of some sort. You won't get that from ULEX. So ULEX um, will be in this fully built out system, an important kernel, but there'll be other things. Also interfaces, right? There's nothing in ULEX that tells you who gets to vote on the rules if you amend them? You know, who, who does that? You need other stuff. So I want to observe that. Um, also, uh, the last thing I'll, I'll raise, and then I think Carl might have some questions, um, is I want to go back to Unix and, and give you the vision that I saw that inspired me when I started working on Ulex. Now, Unix itself is really super cool and great. As you know, I'm a huge fan. Thompson and Ritchie, yay, heroes of computer science, pioneers, really did some great work. It's not enough. What they did is awesome. It allowed us to get to the point where I could buy a computer from IBM and it would have, it would have software installed that works the same on my computer as a computer at the office and I can interface with this computer and run Windows. That's great. It really is great. That's not as good as it gets though. What has really made computers powerful, so important in our lives is their connections with other computers is making a network of platforms running mm -hmm. the operating system, connecting them. And that's the vision for ULEX. The vision I have for ULEX is someday there will be jurisdictions all over the world, heck, maybe in outer space. Elon Musk on Mars, he's already said it's gonna be sovereign. And the first thing I said to myself was that guy's gonna need rules. I got him. Um, <laughs> And so I have this vision of a world where I can be right here in beautiful California, hopefully in a special jurisdiction. We're working on that too. That's another project. <laughs> but we're running ULEX right here in California. And I need to transact business with somebody in, um, you know, perhaps uh, Switzerland. And they're running ULEX too. And now just like TCP IP, the protocol that makes the internet work, just like that allows me to communicate between two nodes on the internet, more or less friction free, we'll be able to do that in this new world. There won't be some cranky local law that says, oh, no, that's a violation of uh, the right of publicity. And I got to deal with somebody in Switzerland and they don't have that rule. And we got this interface problem and there's all these friction costs and it just doesn't run smoothly. I want it to be like the internet. 
so that when I transact with somebody in Switzerland or heck on Mars, we're all running basically the same code. It doesn't mean we're under the same government. I want to be clear about that. ULEX is not, well, I get to take over the world. I get no power at all out of this, frankly. I get my jollies. It really gives me great joy. The thought There's so little that attorneys can do, really, to, to help the world be a better place. I think her, attorneys can be heroes, but most of the time they're just helping a particular person with a particular problem. And I think attorneys are like anybody else. They, they want to help. They really do. And this is my way, I feel, of maybe offering the world something that could help a lot of people. If I could bring internet type network effects to governance, if ULEX could help do that, it would be wonderful. We could help lower some of the barriers that prevent people from cooperating today and, and enjoying exchanges and creating wealth. And the law too frequently gets in the way. I want to create a world where people can run the same basic legal code, be on the same kind of fair level playing field. And sure, they'll have the local rules to control things like, you know, who can, you know, make noise in the street. But as far as doing commercial transactions, same rules, more or less for everybody, fair methods of adjudication that don't involve going to some government court. Um, I really think good things can come of that. It's certainly worth a try. And that's why ULEX is there. And thank you for listening, Carl. That's a quick introduction to ULEX. Thank you very much, Professor. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, like we said earlier, I have uh, uh, some questions for you. Um, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I do have your book here. I have read your book, uh, in particular, the chapter on ULEX. Um, so part, some of my questions come directly out of your talk and some of my questions um, come out of some of the reading I did um, which if uh, our uh, listeners or our watchers are interested, I highly recommend that they uh, go ahead and purchase your book and uh, read it to get like a better introduction and a better understanding of ULEX. So uh, in general, um, in your book and in your talk, you discussed how uh, people have uh, brought in law or people like the uh, uh, Dubai, the Dubai International Financial Center, um, uh, the International Financial Center in uh, Kazakhstan have brought in um, uh, law from England and Wales. Um, and the, you think that personally, uh, from your perspective as a, a professor and as a practitioner, that this is not the best decision to do. Um, and then you've decided that for ULEX, you uh, are going to use law that's been developed by private groups uh, such as ALI or the Uniform Law Commission. Um, however, these, these, uh, these bodies of law developed by ALI and the ULC, um, they have like an American sort of bent or perspective uh, on them. Uh, so do you, are you concerned at all that, um, or, or do, you, do you believe that this will always sort of be the body of law used? Or do you think that there are gonna be other outside groups that will develop other bodies of law? Um. I am concerned about that. And I think it's a fair kind of concern to have. If I were a patriot in Honduras, I would say, well, look, I'm glad you're not flying the US flag or the Canadian flag, but this has a US centric smell to it, frankly. And it does. Uh, the ALI is the American Law Institute and it's not North America. <laughs> they really mean USA. But I will say their horizons are broader than the United States, at least at the ALI. The ULC is much more sort of, we, they, they, the ULC got started as we need laws for the various US states. So that is a little more US centric. The ALI is really about the restatement of the common law. And they do make reference to the laws of England and Wales and Australia and New Zealand and other places. Not as international as our Honduran patriot might like, but it's, you know, it's at least it's not you know, saluting the stars and stripes. And then also, so, you know, I see the concern there, but here's the other point. There's no alternative. I've looked for a restatement of the civil law. I think it'd be great if we had a restatement of the civil law. I would like to have that competition for ULEX, but it hasn't happened. There actually were a few scholars that got together and they said, we're going to do it. And they didn't do it as far as I can tell. They kind of got the project started and they gave it up. I think that would be really useful. I'd also like to see, and this is kind of on my to-do list, we need a restatement of admiralty law. There is nothing in anything that the ALI or ULC or anybody has done to kind of give us a restatement of admiralty law, the law of the sea, and that's important stuff. So I think we need to have more developments. I'd like to see more competing codes, just like Unix was great, but so was Windows, and so was Apple's OS. I think that there should be competition between operating systems. Another reason why I don't think ULEX is going to take over the world, I don't think it should. 
But I do want to see competition between these different standards. And, you know, I just started with what was easiest, what was closest at hand, what are good rules? And I think a lot of countries in the world would say, please give me something like the legal system of the United States. I mean, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm stuck here in, you know, I'm stuck here in, in Libya and I got nothing. I got to go to a judge that you got to bribe him to get the decision. So it could be a step up for a lot of people. Uh, so <laughs> professor, uh, professor, um, uh, in addition to that, I think you did a great job sort of going over, over the issue of bringing up, uh, bringing in different legal traditions from around the world um, to have a better representation and you desire that competition. Um, but uh, certainly what I've seen as one of the most prominent criticisms of uh, special jurisdictions and charter cities is that of imperialism, uh, imperialism or neo-imperialism. You address this extensively in your book. You address it at the beginning of your talk. Um, but I, I certainly think that um, uh, this this particular issue is the the most prominent one that advocates of using a system like ULEX in a special jurisdiction have to address. And so, are there ways which ULEX can help alleviate or prevent this perception of foreign influence? Um, and like I said, you've done a great job so far of uh, you know pushing that you know ULEX is independent of that. But mm -hmm. some some people might need even more encouragement. Yeah, there's, I, yeah, as I've said, that's a, it's a fair thing to worry about. By the way, I have to apologize if anybody can hear tapping in the background uh, because one of my neighbors decided to do some hammering today. Um, anyhow, <laughs> it doesn't usually happen. Um, I'll say a couple things about that. One is you gotta do something, you know, you gotta do something. And what's the alternative? Right now, the alternatives are not as good. The ideal would perhaps be to have a lot of people involved in this interesting project of coming up with kind of generic, bland, useful rules. And so far it's kind of, you know, me out here on my own. Um, I think other people are gonna see, oh yeah, there's something to that. And they'll probably start competing with me. And I say, bring it on, let's do it and together. You know, even as we bang heads, you know, something good will come out of that. But the other things that people could try don't seem to me as appealing. So here is what has happened in some of these international financial centers I cited earlier. They've hired big fancy pants law firms from other countries to come and write their code for them. And that is great for those law firms. It's not good for the countries. It's not good for other law firms. It basically gives one law firm the inside track on the code. So, so let's say you're in Dubai and you say, well, I'm not comfortable borrowing, you know, even if it's from a private party, I don't want to borrow some kind of private party from America to borrow their law. We're going to write up our code from scratch in Dubai. Seems like a good idea. It's a bad idea because what's going to happen? This is what's happened. They said, okay, um, let's hire some attorneys. Um, let's hire some of those English attorneys because they, you're going to be doing this common law thing to attract London bankers. Let's use them. Oh, okay. And um, here they go. And they write this big chunk of code. If you get in, I think, I think it's something they're proud of and they shouldn't be. They say, oh, look at all the rules we have. I'm just, That's not good. Oh, it's good if you're the attorney who wrote those rules because then somebody shows up and they go, okay, I want to set up a corporation and then a couple of, you know, sub corporations you got this complicated scheme. How do I do that? You're going to have to go to this attorney, the firm that wrote the code. So it's like private colonialism. So that's not a good method. You can't go to the legislature and say, legislature, would you please write us some code? No, if you could trust the legislature, you wouldn't need to do this. So I see that it's not as flag free as even I would like it. All I can say is I've tried to take it as far in the direction of flag free and private as possible while keeping a credible, trustworthy set of rules. Um, you know, I did the best I can on that production frontier. There might be some other way to do it, but I've done the best I can to avoid those problems. All right, so professor, I think, um... My next question would be, in what ways uh, can ULEX adapt to the particular needs of a new jurisdiction, like a charter city, um, better than an imported system like what was done in uh, the uh, DF, uh, Dubai International Financial Center? Um, so how, how can ULEX do better, like in what particular ways? A couple of ways I think ULEX has an edge. One is it's all open source. You don't have to come and hire me. You just go to GitHub and download it and you're ready to go. I made it available. We need to talk maybe about copyright, but as far as I'm concerned, no copyright constraints. So I think that's, um, that's, uh, so that's an edge. And um, 
And what I mean, you're asking about tailoring. Okay, so most of the rules in ULEX are pretty generic. I could imagine some of the things you'd want to alter. For example, maybe the age of consent. And so because it's already available on GitHub, all you have to do is do a fork. You, you do a fork. You say, I'm going to take that code, boom. And now on my separate channel for my jurisdiction, we'll say in Uruguay, our Uruguay special jurisdiction, we took ULEX 1.2 and we're going to make it the Uruguay provision. We think the age of consent should be 16. And there's some family law things. We're kind of sensitive about that. A lot of countries, their values come out in their family law. And they, we don't want to use those US rules. We have more respect for families or whatever. And so they do their version. You know, They call it 1.3 or they call it 1.2 Uruguay. And I got nothing to say. You know, I'm like, I'm happy about that. I did it so they could do that. And now they're able to tailor it for their own purposes. All right, so Professor, uh, certainly in the United States now, there are, uh, there's a large debate over the interpretation of legal texts. Uh, legal texts. Um, a lot of this sort of falls along two camps. There are the living constitutionalists and there are the originalists. Um, do you think that ULEX will have issues of interpretation um, in terms of practicing law, especially when it comes to conflict of laws? And I know that uh, some of the meta, meta rules in ULEX ad directly address conflicts of laws but in general, will issues of interpretation be a problem for ULEX? There will, I'm sure, be questions of interpretation. You just can't escape those, right? And the words are never self-interpreting. Um, with regard to the Constitution, by the way, I do want to observe, you know this, Carl, but your uh, listeners might not, that there is a chapter in this book, Your Next Government, about constitutional interpretation, in which I argue convincingly huh, that both originalists and so-called living constitutionalists are wrong. The correct approach to constitutional interpretation is offered right here in the book. I'm happy to have solved that problem for so many constitutional lawyers and scholars. I'm surprised it's taken this long. You treat the Constitution like a contract, which means you apply the rules of contract law interpretation. I won't get talk about that more. I'll just say, if you want to figure out constitutional law, get that book and read that chapter. As applied here, I'll say, yeah, you know, there will be problems. I won't even say problems because that's like saying, I have a problem I have to breathe to stay alive, right? Interpretation, that's just the way the law is. It's not a problem, it's just the way it works. And so what'll happen in ULEX is, there will be interpretations of the application of the rules to particular facts before a particular adjudicatory body. And so, you know, you have a particular panel of three judges and they have to interpret some contract or let's say a tort law claim about um, intentional infliction of emotional distress. So it's kind of a loosey goosey. We have some rules for that, but definitely got to make some judgment calls or whether it was really abusive to say what that person said to that person in public. And that panel has to decide that. There is no binding precedent in ULEX because there's no superstructure of courts and a standing judiciary. So I want to just bring this out, Carl, the way that that over time, we will come to understand the rules of ULEX is by looking at these individual decisions of different courts and not saying, oh, that's the higher court and it binds us. And that's not the way it's gonna work. It's not hierarchical. Rather, it'll all be persuasive authority. It'll all be persuasive authority and it'll be to the next panel. So we now have lots of decisions on intentional infliction of emotional distress on social media. We can't look at old case law completely because they didn't have social media, but we got all these new cases that help us figure it out. Now there's a new panel, new case. They would be foolish not to go back and look at those other opinions. And the attorneys in front of them are gonna say, you've all heard about this famous um, decision that involved this celebrity and how it came out. And we think this case is just like it. And they'll argue the way lawyers always do. All right, Professor, that was really great. I think um, I might have more questions, but uh, I think that our uh, listeners and watchers need to go ahead and uh, pick up your book if they are interested in uh, uh, your perspective on uh, your next government um, on issues of ULEX and governance and law. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out today to speak with us. And is there anything else you'd like to say before uh, we go? I'll say that I'm a big fan of what CCI is doing. Um, I myself am more closely affiliated with the Institute for Competitive Governance, which publishes the first journal dedicated to scholarship in this area, the Journal of Special Jurisdictions. But the way it's shaken out, CCI is doing really great work. I've been loving the podcasts. Uh, I didn't know about this new thing you're doing. I'm sure this is going to be great too. CCI is doing great work over here and kind of ICG is doing slightly different things. So a big fan of CCI. 
and I'll say, if you like what CCI is doing, you might see what ICG is doing, and it's in a different area. It's kind of more scholarly, but I think there's lots of work to be done, my friends. There's a lot we need to do to create this. Really, it's going to be a great new world. It gives me hope for the future. We're going to make government better if people listen and act on the work we're doing, Carl. And man, the world needs better government. So let's keep doing this good work. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, once again, I appreciate you taking the time out and you have a great day. You Bye. too, Carl, thank you.